So, we have a new person, Nancy, who's here in person. Is Ravi here tonight? No, Ravi. Okay. So, a little bit about this text. I told you what it was uh, briefly about on the phone. Uh, this is the text, Tripura Rahasya, the mystery beyond the Trinity. It was a favorite of Ramana Maharshi. Is that a saint with whom you're familiar? No. No. Great mid 20th century saint from Tamil Nadu. Um, it's a tantric text, actually. So it's a part of a larger work. The first half is about tantric ritual, uh, probably what we now call Sri Vidya, which I think Ganesh has studied. Have you studied that? No. no. And then the second part of the work, which we call the knowledge portion, is this, the Tripura Rahasya. And the, the style is a series of stories, which is I, why I like it. But they're very, very deep and subtle. So what we've dealt with, we're all the way up to the 11th chapter now. And we have dealt with three questions in the text. Who am I? What is this world? And how has it come about? We're going to deal with some other questions later. Those are the three that we've dealt with. So for uh, about the first third of the book, we've been dealing with the story of these two characters, 
Hema Leka, and Hema Chuda. Hema Chuda is a comely prince, he's a star. And he's out hunting, and a sandstorm comes up, and he needs to take refuge from the sandstorm, and he finds this hermitage. And this beautiful damsel is there. Her name is Hema Leka. He immediately gets the hots for her. So she says, steady prince, and she sees that he's uh, amorously inclined. If my father comes, he'll tell us what to do. So her father, who's a great saint, comes and immediately takes in the whole situation with his occult powers and says, okay, you two get married. So she goes off to Hema Judah's palace and marries him. So they fool around a lot and they get involved doing the mufti pufti in all sorts of places and stuff like that. And Hema Judah says, Dear, I find nothing more pleasurable than jumping your bones. How come you don't seem to be enjoying it as much as I do? And she says, well, my lord, I am just a mere woman. And I am always asking the question, where is happiness? Where is pleasure? And Hema Judah looks at her and says, Silly woman, everybody knows the answer to that. When you get what you want, you're happy. And when you don't get what you want, you're not. Just, oh, is that so? So she starts to introduce him to these ideas that all of the things in this world are, in fact, impermanent. You find this in Gita, don't you? That idea that the best of situations is laced with sorrow. So obviously one cannot find a permanent happiness there. So she further instructs him in this teaching on the source of happiness to find out that it is the vancha, it's the desiring. It's the spraha, the longing itself that's so painful. He begins to develop a distaste for worldly pleasures. But he continues in his old habits and he's ashamed of them. <laughs> Sounds like you and me, doesn't it? So she says, ah, he's developing mature dispassion. I think he's ready for now. So she initiates him into the greatest of all secrets, the science of self-knowledge. Who am I? What's my essential nature? I am not the body. The body is mine. I am not the mind with its feelings and judgments. I'm the knower of the mind. I'm not the subtle intellect. I'm the knower of the thoughts. Who am I? I am that pure awareness, the ground of being. That's the witness of the body and the mind. She says, no, go meditate. He goes and meditates. He sits down and first time there's this bright light. Ooh, ooh, is that the self? And he tries to get it, plunges within and tries to stop his mind and darkness is there. He tries it again, he plunges his mind within and he falls asleep. Sounds like our meditation journey, doesn't it? And then, of course, this is all truncated because of literary uh, convention. This can take years and years of our practice. 
plunges the mind within. All of a sudden, deep within, there's this great peace. One persistence. What is it? Paul's first wife. She comes up. She goes, I'm not interested in that now. Come on. I'm interested in knowledge. So he has developed mature dispassion at this point. Testing. And she further instructs him about the nature of the self. What is that by which everything is known? But itself is never known as an object. So he goes within again, within again, and enters into samadhi. That state where I experience. The juice, the taste of the bliss of my own self nature. She comes to visit him again and she's all kind of like a drunkard who says, Oh, my dear, how is it that you know of this state? And you're not in it all the time. She says, My Lord, how can it be a perfect state if its gain or loss is accomplished by the opening or the closing of the eyes? length of eight grains of barley. She begins to instruct him that next step is to see the self in and through the world. And she does, and he gets rooted in that knowledge. Then he instructs the whole court, and everybody gets enlightened. So now the frame of our story, there's the Guru, the Tatriya, and he's talking to this fellow named Parashurama. Parashurama says, yes, but I don't get it. How can this world be nothing but consciousness? So in chapter 11, the Tatriya has been instructing us that the phenomenal world comes about essentially in the same way as the dream state comes about. You are the god of your dream. So at night, when you have a dream, example I've been using this week, I had the weirdest dream the other night. I was in my old roommate Perry's 56 Packard. Who do you know who dreams about a 56 Packard? Sitting in the passenger seat, Perry was off someplace, I don't know. The engine was on, no, the engine was off, but the car was in the Started to roll back because the emergency brake wasn't working. So I'm trying to get over in front of the wheel and turn on the key and then you know, put it in gear. So the car would so in the dream, I created a dream body from which I had a locus of perception. I peeped out at the dream world. And there were objects, emotions, and thoughts and situations in the dream that I was aware of. But upon awakening, as real as the dream seemed, I saw that it was just mine. I sure seen real. When yoga thunders. This is no different. Now, there is a slight difference. I am not privy to your dream. You're not privy to my dream. Who's doing the dreaming? It is the Lord. It is Ishwar who is dreaming this incredible world. And in it are all the various beings 
who are deluded by the Lord's Maya. We do not know it's really a dream. But we can wake up. And that's the process of yoga. So the yogi not only realizes my own self as the ground of being, the witnessing consciousness, but the yogi also realizes Sarvam Kalvinam Dhamma, as Chandogya Upanishad says. All this world is verily Brahman, consciousness. That makes sense to you? <laughs> it does. It makes sense. All right. Okay. So we'll continue. We're in chapter 11. Does anyone remember what verse we're on? 58. Mark, do you know? Yeah, we're on verse 58. Verse 58? Yes. Ganesh, can you help us out? Hane karasatai vasyad malinyam tat chiter nahi ekatna rupya chik chikte Ekatne rupya chichakte akhanda akhanda pacha sarvatan arikatma babahe to who nirmalyam sarvato dhikam. Purity can only be the quality of having many objects of experience. Pure consciousness surely does not have that because of the sameness of nature, of the power of consciousness and its undivided nature always. Further, on account of its own nature being void, its purity is greater than all. So this ground of being, this consciousness that makes up the world, one of the greatest metaphors that I like is the crystal. Over there in the curio cabinet, I have a crystal ball made of flawless quartz crystal. If I were to bring it out and move it around, you could look into the crystal ball and you'd see images in it. But I can't cut open the crystal ball and pull out images. Are there images in the stone or not? The stone is Spatika Ganam, a homogeneous mass of crystal. But because of its nature, images appear in it. Are they there? Well, they certainly seem to be there. They appear to be there. But they're only optical illusions. So also this phenomenal world. Mandukya says, Vijnana Ganam. A homogeneous mass of consciousness. Vishuddham, extremely pure. Near Malam, without any taint or dirt, nothing. Yet the world of name and form up. Appears in it. Yet that ground of being is never really changed. Now, we've talked again about some of the obvious corollaries of this understanding. We as human beings, if we want to look at what we call Vyavahara, our transactions in the world, reenact the creative principle of the infinite. So to some degree, we certainly create our experience of the phenomenal world through our deeply rooted beliefs. 
So Nancy, have you been exposed to any of the new age stuff where they do affirmations and visualizations or or into manifesting stuff like that? Yes, very much. (laughs) Okay. I have some news for you. They stole it from yoga. It goes back thousands of years. Why does it work to the degree that it works? It works because the world is not solid. Your body is your mind grossified. And so what we can do, or I like to frame it this way, all this is like a dream, but it doesn't have to be a nightmare. Now, some things in this world through what we call a sankalpa. Sankalpa is an almost untranslatable word. It means wish, will, thought, intention. And the law of sankalpa is any sankalpa consistently maintained, got to be consistent about it, that isn't contradicted or conflicted tends towards grossification, or to use the New Age language, manifests. See? That's a metaphysical law. Now, most of us have pretty wimpy sankalpa. S-A-N-K-A-L-P-A. You don't need to write it down. Actually, I prefer that you didn't. It's just a real present. These words come around again. So, if our sankalpa is in alignment with God's sankalpa, things really work in our lives. If we fight City Hall, it usually makes us pretty sick. For example, I had a student several years ago and she had um, an unfortunate love affair. And she really hated this guy. He was abusive and terrible to her and stuff like that. So I introduce her to this law of sankalpa. So what does she do? She goes home and hates on him. Does sankalpas that he's going to be, you know, sick or terrible life or stuff like that. And she tells me about it. And I said, For God's sake, stop. You're going to make yourself sick. Because that energy that we put out comes back to us. So ultimately, we want to always stay in the law of harmony. Now, most people who are into the manifesting stuff do not deal with a a common belief that everybody in spiritual ignorance has, which is I'm unhappy because I'm not getting what I want. So I'm going to do manifesting to get what I want and that's what's going to make me happy. You may get what you want, but that doesn't solve the problem. What you need to do is begin to see who you are and that the mind freed from longing is the mind that's at peace. All right, enough on that. Next verse, please. Aspato Ashankataha, Pratibimba Swaru Padnyaha, Pratibimbam Prachakshate, Chagade Ratudam, Chagade Tadrisham Sarvam, Sarvai Samabhilakshitam. The knowers of the nature of reflections consider the appearance of a thing not manifesting by itself on account of connection with another, the reflection. The entire world is observed by all like this. 
So we have this word pratibimba, which means an image or a reflection in a mirror. So we have the classic image of the city in the mirror. So I like to think if you go up to San Francisco, you go to the top of Twin Peaks and you face west and you hold up a mirror, you can look into the mirror and you can see downtown San Francisco. You can see the trolley cars going up and down Market Street, all the little people walking around. But is the mirror turning into a city? No. In fact, it is the mirror itself that's appearing as the pratibimba, the reflection. Now, if I turn it around and I look downtown and I hold the mirror, I see the Sutra Towers. What happened to the city in the mirror? It's just the mirror itself appearing as the pratibimba, the image. Now, this metaphor, this example falls short because in a mirror, you need an external object to create the reflection. Is that so? The Lord needs so no such thing. The world appears like the image in a mirror. This is not so woo-woo as it seems. For a moment, close your eyes, visualize the strawberry. The strawberries are so good right now. Now open your eyes. What is the material cause of the strawberry of your imagination? What'd you make it out of? Just the stuff of your mind. Where did you make it? In my mind. Who made it? I did. Isn't that your direct experience? What's the difference between the strawberry of your imagination and the strawberry of a dream? When you dream about a strawberry, there's a similarity and there's a difference. Similarity is both your imagination. The difference is in the dream, I have this phenomenon of ignorance. I don't know it's an imagination. And I take it as real. That's what's going on here. It's all just imagination. But the person in ignorance takes it as real. It's still just vibration held together by thought. Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya. Shankara thunders that in several texts. Brahman alone is real, the ground of being. Jagat, the manifested universe, Mitya, illusion. It's all real. Next verse. Satona Basate Kwapi Basate Chat Chidashraya Ato Jagat Syad Ato Jagat Syad Adarsha Pratibimba Susamitam. The world does not shine or manifest by itself anywhere. It manifests on account of dependence, on consciousness. Therefore, the world must be very much like the reflection in a mirror. Yeah. 
sense. So the world does not appear apart from consciousness. It doesn't, it's not illumined by itself. Now, Quantum physics is getting very close to this. We discussed this a bit last week. Are you into science at all? No, man. I like physics. <laughs> so I'm a musician. It's fascinating. That was, that was my old job. So I'm not a scientist at all. So I, I need help in explaining this. But if I've understood it, for example, the experiments that they do with light. So if you shine light through a slot, if you don't observe it, it behaves like energy. If you observe it, it behaves like matter, it's discrete photons. The act of looking at it makes it appear as matter. Uday, did I explain that right? Yeah, pretty much. Help me out here. Yes. Uh, it, uh, it, I mean, depending on the type of experiment you do, you could manifest either its wave nature or its matter nature. But, but you're doesn't absolute... the act of observation determine how you, it's perceived? Yes, that's what I'm saying. If I, if I design an experiment to manifest its, uh, its wave-like nature, I will observe it to be a wave, not a particle. Okay. And vice versa. I'm wrong. But anyway, what basically we're, uh, quantum physics is also talking about is things like electrons. They're not like little planets going around a nucleus, like uh, the solar system thing that I learned in the seventh grade. There's like the probability of where they are. And so the whole idea that science is coming very close to is the act of knowing is what makes it actually appear as name and form. And consciousness is everywhere. People have asked me, oh, do you think the earth is a conscious being? Of course it is. There is no place where consciousness is absent. Going on, next I, uh, next uh, verse, please. Chitir vichitranya bhavaihi rupaktapi bhasini the wonderful consciousness, like a mirror, is endowed with reflection quite without deviating from its own natural state, even a little, though colored by other natures or objects reflected by it. So just like in a mirror, if Saundarya goes into the bathroom and looks at my mirror, there's a beautiful woman. But if I go into the bathroom and look at the mirror, there's an ugly old man. The mirror is not change. I cannot borrow her beauty. Put it in my mirror. So also, Good things, bad things, beautiful things, ugly things, life, death, abundance, famine, supernovas, black holes. All of it appears in consciousness, like the various things in a mirror. But this Brahman, this ground of being, is never changed by it. The 
world is not created. The world is imagined. Jim, I have a question. Please, speak up. Um, but I, I guess what I'm not understanding is the difference between in your strawberry example, you told us to think of a strawberry. So it, was, it felt like a very active, conscious decision to think and imagine a st strawberry. But if I'm dreaming, I don't actually plan what appears in the dream, it just appears. Good point. So there is much more of a sense of passivity for the dream ego. It's part of the nature of ignorance. Mm -hmm. And we have the same kind of experience here. You know, you didn't consciously say, let there be COVID yeah. or let there be vaccine. Our experience in the dream of this world is up here like we're passive to the circumstances. Mm -hmm. That's the nature of the dream ego in ignorance, mm -hmm. both in the dream state and the waking state. Now, let's follow this up. If you're like most ordinary people, you've got an inner dialogue going through your mind all day long. Mm -hmm. Do you really choose those thoughts? <laughs> Have you, have you thought of your husband? Yeah. Yes. Do you choose it or does it just pop up? <laughs> yeah. So, so even, but if you think about him now, you know, he's, he's not here next to us. It's your imagination, your memory. Does that make it a little clearer? It does, yes. Yeah. So that idea of feeling passive is part of the nature of Maya. We will get a story about this later on. About a guy who, uh, uh, a magician comes into his court. He's a king. And I can't remember if they called him an Indra V or a Maya V. Both words mean, uh, translated as magician or juggler. But a hypnotist is more like it. Mm -hmm. And he goes with a bunch of uh, feathers. And all of a sudden, a horse comes in, and the king gets on the horse and then he rides on out. And all of a sudden, there's a tree there, and he reaches up and grabs the limb of the tree. And the court horse goes on, and the horse is just kind of gone. And then he drops down, and he's very thirsty. And then this lady comes and so it has all the qualities like a dream which is also how many of us move through this world very very good question all right so yes please this is god's dream but god is obviously very conscious of it or is God passive in the dream? No, God is conscious. Okay. What they're saying, what we had in, in earlier classes, that part of the nature of consciousness or God, they're the same thing, is there's this perfect freedom of will. That the potentiality for anything appears in consciousness. Yet, God doesn't, I mean, a lot of people have these, these anthropomorphic ideas. God was lonely. That's why he created people. You know, God wanted us to love him, so he had someone to love. This is all nonsense. Mm -hmm. This is all nonsense. Consciousness itself is not the agent. It's the stuff that's imagined. Agency takes place. Just like when you are the dreamer, the waker is not the agent. The waker is in bed, sound asleep. It's difficult to understand. The 
but don't worry about it. God is not in trouble. <laughs> I didn't think so. God isn't deluded. <laughs> but we are. We are and we're not. It's like a dream. Truth is, we're just fine. You were never born. You are changeless. All that will change is the stuff you're aware of. And the way you perceive it. Is that? Oh. So, how old are you? 57. 57. How many times does 7 go into 57? Um. <laughs> eight. eight. Eight times? Okay, eight so science eight. says you've died eight times. If you go look at a photo album of a photo of yourself as say a 10 year old where is that body gone literally down the toilet down the drain there's not a cell in your body that's the same every seven years right yeah i'll be 58 in july yeah <laughs> so <laughs> But the point I'm getting at is, did you cease to exist for one moment? Some people say, oh, it's memory. That's what holds it all together. You know, I remember when I was 10. I remember when I was 15. Which they say, the 15th, the 16th? 17th. 17th already. 17th of June, 2021. What were you doing on the 17th of June 10 years ago? No idea. Yeah. <laughs> Did you cease to exist? No. no. So it is not memory that gives me the sense of continuous existence. It's because I is nitya, eternal, birthless, changeless, deathless. Now, I'm going to do one more exercise since you're here. So you look out at the room and you see the room from your viewpoint. Sound looks out at the room and she sees the room from her viewpoint. You are aware of your body. She's aware of her body. You are aware of your feelings. She's aware of her feelings. You are aware of your thoughts. She is aware of her thoughts, but if you slow your mind down and look behind your eyes, have this radical reversal of your attentive faculty, who are you? See what's there is just pure awareness. And sound looks behind her eyes and notices the noticer. What's there is pure awareness. The self in you is not like the self in her. The self in you is the self in her. One conscious being is huge and little at the same time. Evading everyone. Because we're all connected. We're not connected. We're all, it's only one of us here. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Next verse, please. Darpana Pratibimbana Darpana Nyata. As there is no difference from the mirror for reflections in a mirror, so there is no difference from the consciousness that is the self for reflections in the consciousness that is the self. No, there is no image without the mirror. There is no world without consciousness. Consciousness is the reality, 
The world is an appearance superimposed on the reality and is not different from it. Yes. So this there's not individual little consciousnesses. It's like this vast space of consciousness. And these robots, these body, mind, intellects move in it, but they're fundamentally inert. The conscious being that enlivens them. That one little point. Chidakash, the space of consciousness itself. Chidatma space of the self itself. No one is born. No one really dies. And all the names and forms are constant their nature. Next verse. Darpane Pratibimbo he Bimba he to Niru Pita Chitispa Tanya he to Sia Pratibimbo he jagata. It is seen that the reflection in a mirror as an object, as its cause. The reflection of the world in pure consciousness, pure consciousness should indeed have the freedom of will of pure consciousness as its cause. So again, we go back to this idea, our image of the, the, the idea, the metaphor of the image in the mirror breaks down because in a mirror, you need an external object to make the image. But in consciousness, that's not necessary. Classically in the scriptures, we have these two metaphors, like the waves in the ocean, like the city in the mirror. So when you see the waves storming away, the waves are nothing but the ocean appearing as the waves. They're not separate. When I see the white froth on the breaking waves, is the white froth different than ocean? No, it's not a soapy ocean. It's just the way it looks. And if you dive down deep in the ocean, silence. But this metaphor breaks down because the surface of the ocean actually undergoes a change. City in the mirror. All these objects appear in the mirror. They are the mirror appearing as pratibimba reflections. But the mirror undergoes no change. This metaphor breaks down because you need an external object. Go to your direct experience. Let's go back to visualizing the strawberry. Now let the strawberry go and visualize an elephant. Did it take more of you to visualize an elephant than a strawberry? Or a really cool one. <laughs> Imagine you're standing on a cliff overlooking a vast plain, with maybe a river in the middle of it. And in the distance are great peaks of mountains. You've created vast space in consciousness. Oh, golly. I had to really get four extra quarts of consciousness to do that one, Jim. No. <laughs> no. And you didn't turn into a strawberry or a mountain or an elephant. It appeared, it's nothing but the fabric of your own mind, yet your own mind is not touched 
I the strawberry or the mountain. So also all this appears in consciousness. Seen but not real. You go to the West Oakland BART station and you look down the tracks. The tracks meet in the distance. Oh, all the trains are going to crash. Oh. The tracks do not meet in the distance. It's an optical illusion. Seen, but not real. You go out to Ocean Beach. You're sitting on the sand and you see a container ship leaving the port of San Francisco, heading out into the ocean. And as it approaches the horizon, first the hull goes down, then the container slowly sinks and is gone. Oh dear, the container ship fell off the edge of the world. No, it's an optical illusion because of the curvature of the earth. Seen, but not real. You watch the clouds form into castles or dragons or whatever you want to imagine. Is there a real dragon in the sky? No. Seen, but not real. Brahma Satyam Jagan Mitya Iti Evam Rupo Vinishchaya Ruyam Nitya Anitya Vastu Viveka Samudhavita Brahman alone is real phenomenal world is unreal. You want to have a firm conviction of this in your mind. This is known as discrimination between the real and the unreal. Next verse. Kasan Kalpa Ram Prashya Swatmani Prati Bimbatan Bhavan Bimbadina Bhutan Nir Nimitta Bhasanan Rama Consider the objects of the Hang on, there's a motorcycle going by and I missed the last part. Uh, just do the English, that'll be fine. Rama Consider the objects or thoughts reflected in your own self or individualized consciousness on account of your own will, which are bereft of things serving as sources of reflection and whose appearance is causeless. Yes. So here, the Patria has done the same exercise that I did with you with the strawberry. Consider the things, the objects you bring into your own individual consciousness. There's no external object needed to make them. It is by virtue of your own will that you've done it. I suggest it. Visualize a strawberry. Poof, you did that. You see? Now, somebody's going to say the question, that's not really true, Jim, because there was an external object in the waking state. I saw strawberries in the store. That's how I knew there were what strawberries were. Okay. Point is, you could visualize something fantastic like a push me pull you. But there is no external object that you drew. Next verse. 
संकल्प एव स्वातंत्र्यम चितेरुच्छ नमीर्यते असंकल्प कषायां सा चितिस्वच्छै करूपिणी the freedom of pure consciousness alone becoming swollen or becoming grosser from its state of being from a state of being a subtle power of consciousness is called will or imagination in the state of absence of that will or imagination that consciousness is pure and of a single nature so here the tatriya uses the word we talked about before sankalpa he describes it as what do you say consciousness becoming swollen that's such uh, a yeah 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 right wonderful phraseology wonderful phraseology meaning when i spin on a thought it becomes more and more real for me you know you're uh, having a problem at work you spend all morning having a conversation with someone who's not in the room you'd never do that would you <laughs> by the time you get to work oh, 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 oh. what happens any son kalpa consistently maintained that's not conflicted or uh, contradicted tends towards grossification it becomes swollen i just experienced that go ahead share with us oh um my boss and i had a conflict and and i just kept ruminating on it and trying to go back and forth with him through emails and just on and on and i it just got <laughs> huge yeah yeah it's so let's do an experiment i don't have a job anymore ah! <laughs> explaining and defending and no 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 just, no but what yeah. we could do <laughs> Are you seriously don't have the job you left it? Yes. Okay. Then yeah. It's... But what I want to invite you to do, see what happens. Tonight go home in your meditation and do this conscious deliberate meditation. I live and I move and I have my being in God. I live and move and have my being in a loving universe that conspires for my well-being. What appears as that boss is a manifestation of the divine. I will not believe my senses. Instead, right where the trouble seems to be there god is yeah now what's the trick you have to disengage your son kalpa sensory data your sensory data reports yesterday's son kalpa Let me say that again. This is I'm simplifying it. Your sensory data reports yesterday's sankalpa. You're driving your car and the check engine light comes on. What does that check engine light mean? You better pull into a gas station and check your engine. <laughs> It is an indicator of what's in your engine. So you guys who've been in class before you've heard this so many times it is a spiritual axiom that if i'm disturbed no matter the cause i'm the one with the attachment i'm the one with the expectation i'm the one with the identification 
It is my disquiet that I am projecting. Exactly. I'm aware of that. Yeah. Well, it's progress, well, not perfection. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, yeah. Cut yourself slack. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and opportunity for something else arises. Yeah. But this is what the yogi and a lesson is learned. <laughs> yeah, also. Yeah. But ego always says it's out there. They done it to me. Ego perceives itself as a victim of the world. Isn't that what happens in your dream? You are in the dream ego identified with the dream body and the dream world seems to be happening to you isn't that your experience in the dream now, some people actually go through practices of doing lucid dreaming to do things like astral projection i think ganesh did that for a while you still doing that at all ganesh or did you give that up yeah, I'm not doing it right now. Yeah, but you did for a while where you were actually gaining control over your dream awareness. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's possible. Where you don't have that experience of passivity in a dream. Same thing. The yogi doesn't have to be at the effect of yesterday's unconscious sankalpas basically created in ignorance. So chances are the relationship you had with the boss. Tell me this is the first time you've had this feeling. Oh no. <laughs> oh no. And he was a very good friend of mine for nine years. But it doesn't also, matter. It probably yeah. comes from your family of origin. I'm sure. And <laughs> so probably we, yeah, some yeah. incarnation before that. This you know, some lesson needed to be learned. Absolutely. Yeah. I, you know, and I'm, a, I'm really aware of my stuff. I know I was doing it when I was engaging in it. Oh yeah, didn't that suck? Yeah. And hey Machuda. Like, hey Machuda went through the same thing. They wrote a book about you a thousand years ago. Oh. <laughs> Isn't that nice to know that well, you're a textbook right. case? Well, you know, I was around a thousand years ago, so yeah. <laughs> why not write about me? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but anyway, that's the idea that we're talking about. And some of this, you know, it, it can be incredibly difficult. Now, there are those yogis, they just step back, they really don't care, it's all just a dream. There are others who do some dream shaping. You choose. This is a tantric text. So we're going to talk a little bit more about making a difference in the world through sun culture. Part of what this book teaches. What is this world? How has it come about? All right, next verse. I think we're going to get to the story of the mountain pretty soon. Evam chite vishuddhaika upaya srishkita pura brihat svatantriyam abhava. Thus there existed the great or unlimited freedom of consciousness, which was of a pure and single nature before creation. That was of the nature of will alone at the beginning of creation. Now, this parallels things we find in the book of Genesis and in the prologue to the Gospel of John. Were you raised Christian? Um, I was baptized as a Catholic, and, but my mother was not okay. uh, religious. So 
in the story of Genesis, before creation, in the beginning, there was void and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Do you remember that part of the story? Yes, I went to Catholic school for 12 years. I mean, okay. not 12 years. What um, do they mean so I was by 12. What, or sometimes it's translated as darkness was on the face of the waters. Mm -hmm. So water is a very standard metaphor for consciousness. Mm -hmm. Consciousness precedes creation in the Hebrew Bible. Prologue to the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the word. And they use the Greek, logos. Doesn't mean scriptures, something you write on a page. Logos means like we, all the ologies that we have. It means the complete embodied understanding. It's the cosmic Christ. And the word was with God. And in the Greek, it actually says, and the word was face to face with God. We're back to that whole idea of consciousness being aware. So in yoga, we would say in the beginning was Shakti. And Shakti was eternal with Shiva, consciousness. And the, God, the prologue says in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Meaning Shakti is nothing but consciousness appearing as energy and was not anything made but by the word. I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. Meaning the entire phenomenal world is nothing but consciousness appearing as name and form. It's there in the Hebrew scriptures. It's there in the Christian scriptures. It's there in the Upanishads. He's now breaking it down here in Tripura Rahasa. Why do all these scriptures basically say the same thing? Because these deep mystics have all had the direct experience. I've heard that Jesus studied in uh, India. There are many people who believe that. Mm -hmm. We have no no actual evidence of it, but it there's that big gap from age thirteen big to gap. age thirty. Big gap. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. It's now nine o'clock. We'll stop here. Om Pur Namada Pur Namidam Pur Nat Pur Namudachate Pur Nasya Pur Namadaya Pur Nameva Vishishate Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Sri Guru Pionamaha Ari Om. Om. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. <laughs>